actually had the privilege of being involved with uh, a meeting that was at UL as far as the, some of the tactical panels that were going on. And in the, in the hallway there, um, I met up with uh, Gavin Horn. And I was introduced with, uh, with a, a joint friend that, that we have that he's done work with um, from Milwaukee Fire Department with Eric Roden. And we were able to uh, quickly exchange experiences and he knew that we had had a line of duty death very recently because of Northbrook being so close to Kenosha and he was up at Northbrook a lot. And uh, we had a, a 16 year uh, lieutenant who succumbed to metastatic melanoma uh, after a, a long battle, uh, being on the job, being off the job, being on the job. And he finally died in uh, February 25th of 2015 um, from that. And he was, he was someone who obviously was a very well-respected member of our agency. He was one of my lieutenants on my shift, uh, but more importantly, we grew up together. We knew each other since we were four years old. Uh, we were best men in each other's weddings. Our kids are a day apart. Um, so we had a lot of similarities, and uh, it, it hit hard. It was a, it was a big deal for our department, um, but it hit me personally as well, and, and probably a, a bit more than, than you would have anticipated. But no one knows what's a, what that's like until you go through it. So you, you obviously you've got that motivation to, to kind of keep that memory going and, and to learn everything you can from that. So last year, you said you've already taken some of that, the, uh, the information from that uh, research and you've applied it to your organization. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. We, uh, as you said, there was a good motivation. It was personal and professional. Uh, there, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of pull as far as being able to make things better for, for the people who work on your agency so that they can accomplish their mission in a better way. And in, in no way did we have any interest in, in sidestepping what we do. Um, the, the term often is said to, to be safe. Well, we can't be safe. Our job is not safe. We can be educated. We can be careful. We can make good decisions. We can have knowledge. And to be able to be paired up with the the, essentially the, the education and the, the theory that was going on here was just an, an outstanding opportunity. Um, based on the, the results of the first part of this with, that, was, that was centered around the tactical and more of a, a combat nature non-1403 fire, um, we, we have made changes and we continue to make those. We've, we've developed what's called a post-exposure protocol and it's something that, that is a living document um, it, it's, I don't want it to stay the same, uh, probably ever. And maybe it'll stabilize in a few years, but I don't think until then it's going gonna, it's gonna to see much dust. And it regards uh, changing your gear and showering, where we keep our gear, how we actually operate at the scene and things like that, and I can go in a little more detail. Um, we, in Kenosha, we've been fortunate to have two sets of frontline gear for some time. And, and we know that we're a, a little bit of an anomaly that way, and we're, we, we realize that we're fortunate with it. However, for some reason, we had not had a second hood. And it was one of those things that was almost a, uh, the normalization of deviancy, where we, we thought, wow, we, we've been changing out our outer garment, but we didn't do our hood. And then we started looking into it and thinking, well, we wear the same helmet over and over and over and over. So now we're looking at that. That's nothing that we've changed yet, but we have we have looked into we need to do a better cleaning, cleaning it. We also need to do a better job, um, perhaps even getting another one. And, and that's something that we're evaluating. Um, at scenes, we've gotten very aggressive in regards to skin wipes uh, to make it part of the culture. Uh, use them, use them and lose them. Let them drop wherever they are. We'll worry about it afterwards. Uh, to, to change out very quickly, to open up, and to actually make sure that you're wiping around your neck and that you're cleaning your hands. We, as Gavin talked about this evening, we realized that we were going to rehab with black hands, and you never thought about it. We, we mandated that you changed out your gear after a fire and that you go and wash it. However, the person who was getting new gear on had dirty hands and dirty necks, and then they were going on another call because we didn't transfer the importance of going and taking that immediate shower. So now when that company backs in, they go and decontaminate right away. Um, it's a big change in culture for us, though. And uh, beyond that is what we're doing as far as the design of our apparatus, where we are actively making spaces in our engines and trucks and ambulances to have gear outside versus inside. We're uh, isolating SCBA from, from the, the uh, officers and firefighters so that they can go on non-fire calls without having direct contact with these SCBA and their Class B uniform. And that's, that's done through 
in no way covering it, just the, the parade covers that we're able to put on there. But nevertheless, all of these things add up in, a, in not only a financial way, but also a relatively significant cultural change. So looking at your experiences now through, through two evolutions of the research, what would be a nugget that you would basically want to send back to anybody that's out there watching um, or might be on the fence about research in general? What would you like to share with them? I think that there's enough research out there now, I don't think I know, there's enough research out there now that you can make informed decisions. You can do what is, what is best for the people who work for you and you can start in ways that cost absolutely no money. Um, we have to take showers eventually, so take them first. Um, we all have latex gloves or nitro, nitrile gloves now. Use those gloves when you clean up your equipment. Put yourself back in service first before you're putting your equipment back in service. The stuff will be fine. If you have to use it when it's dirty, as long as you clean up yourself, you're gonna be okay to use it again. It's not gonna be injured by, by being dirty. Um, and for a lot of agencies, especially those that have fiscal or financial issues, which all of us do, um, to focus on those changes that can be made that don't regard money. And, and those are pretty simple, to get skin wipes, which are basically baby wipes, um, to take showers, to change out your uniforms, and to get that gear laundered. Uh, if you can't, if your agency can't uh, afford to have two sets of gear, to get it laundered, which is very inexpensive, especially if, if you don't have uh, that many fires, and to be able to know that when your personnel put that on the second time, that they're, they're gonna be clean. And just like we, we treat hazmat situations, the less contamination you get on you, on your gear, on your apparatus, in your engine house, is the less that you have to clean up. So, so focus on those goals and log on to UL, log on to NIOSH, look at IFSI. They have all of their findings out there in very easy to read manuscripts where people can walk away with easy nuggets to implement very, very quickly.